haven't tried these Oreo lemon, these lemon Oreo cookies. Hmm, if now. It don't make no goddamn sense how good these cookies are. This is the perfect mug because this time last year we were in Belgium enjoying the Christmas season and the Christmas markets and this year we're at home. Mm. Hey, hi, hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess and welcome to another installment of Book Community where I try to keep you abreast of all the goings on in the book community. You may see appearances by my co-host Nigel and his camo cone that are gonna be in the corner of the screen, I'm sorry. But he's already a pretty clingy dog, which I love. And he is definitely stage five clinger right now after he had his little surgery. So he just likes to be close. But looks like maybe the bookish community is finally focusing on their Christmas shopping because there's not as much going on this week as the last couple of weeks where I've, <laughs> I've put out two um, tea videos in one week. But there are still a couple things and especially an important article that I read that I want to talk about. So let's get it pappy. Ooh, that's good. Mm. We're going to start off with romance Landia drama. And as my friend Meredith says, don't insult the romance genre because romance Landia will come for you, which is a fact as we have seen in previous videos. So the article in question was written so this was an article um, that was written and then shared by Julie Matlin, um, who's a freelance writer and became a romance writer during this year, during the pandemic. So the article that she wrote was writing erotica was a 2020 career pivot I never saw coming. And so in the article, she talks about how the lockdown started March 12th in Montreal and she had a lot going on. Her mother was entering the final stages of cancer. She had two children, um, you know, toilet paper was scarce, all of these things. She also is medicated for both anxiety and depression and needed to take care of herself. So at first it was binging Outlander, but once that was over, she needed something else to throw herself into. And she says, I had been curious about pinning something sexy for a long time. And so she signed up for a online int intimacy writing workshop with her local writers association. One of the things that she had to practice was forcing two strangers into a situation and engaging them in an intimate conversation. So she rewrote the night her and her husband met and then that just evolved into more words and more words until she knew that she had like a 25,000 word novella. She sent it out to friends to read. She got good feedback. They said uh, the work was good. The sex was smoking. Her friend gave her a wetness meter because that's what best friends do. Um, she talked to her husband and he had also been doing something, said building an industrial IoT platform. And he said, so while I'm trying to better the world, you'll be writing smut. And then she talked to her children about it. Her daughter didn't really care, but I guess her son was interested and intrigued by the idea of a empire. Here's where some of the things I think people really got upset with that she that she said in the article. I don't write about billionaires or mafia bosses, shapeshifters or royalty. I craft stories about real people in everyday situations who find love in surprising places. And then they proceed to have mind blowing sex which is definitely a dig at a lot of romance because it came off like oh i don't write those i write stories about real people and then she said pivoting to during the pandemic has saved me um i mean regretfully her mom did pass away in july and um it was really hard for her to move on so it was something for her to throw herself into to make herself get out of bed every day i totally understand that it's just like you can also enjoy that and write romance without you know, looking down on other romance books. And then the people responded, of course, like Christina Lauren, the author duo said, Julie, this is not a good take. And then someone said, this whole piece is condescending as fuck. If you think there aren't hundreds plus of romance novels out there that are sexy and emotional, you're wrong. Plus there's a difference between romance, erotic romance and erotica. Okay. Also, there is nothing wrong with romance novels are not and I am not the one to explain the difference between romance, erotic romance, and erotica because 
I haven't read that many romance, but I definitely can see where they're getting the condescending vibes because it was almost like she was saying, I write high quality erotic stories where other ones are just gross and about sex. Since becoming part of the bookish community online, especially being on Twitter, I've just learned about the vastness of romance and romance landia, and there's just so much. There are shapeshifter romances and mafia boss romances, and you know, there's some really dark romances and then like really cute ones, and then there's just, just so many subgenres within romance that you can. I think even someone who's like traditional, like I don't like romance, like myself, can find a story that they would like if you look for it. There's so much within romance and for um, her to just generalize it like that is really disappointing. So I totally understand that. And I'm glad that she was able to find something to get her through this um, pandemic because it has been stressful for so many people and then, you know, found something that can make money even better. But it doesn't have to come at the the um, expense of people in the same genre that you're writing in. And so on her Twitter profile, I'm sure she saw all of the uh, feedback and she said, I'm checking out for a bit, see anxiety. I apologize to all those I offended. It was never my intention. I have only love, we're all human. I am reading everything. I am listening and I am learning. I'm sorry, my anxiety is sky high and I just need a minute. Now, I totally understand, but I just had to point that out because what has been the, the theme of all of our of my videos lately is I'm listening and learning, but I, you know, I don't wish any ill will tor towards her. I hope she can deal with her mental health and then, you know, come back and maybe <clears throat> look at the criticism and realize where she went wrong and then keep writing, but just don't look down on other people in the romance community, but yeah. That was something that my friend sent me. Do not come for romance writers or readers. Don't do it. I'm sorry if you can hear stuff. Nigel's like, he keeps licking his cone and he's trying to lick his feet. I just, Jesus be a fence. Now let's talk about publishing again. This shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone, but still when I read the article, just to see the specific numbers was surprising, appalling, and it pissed me off. But I'm sure if you've been on Twitter, then you've seen this article that was written um, in the New York Times and it's about just how white is the book industry. So I am screen recording my laptop so you can see the article. It looks really, the graphics are really cool in the beginning. And so these are all of the books by black authors this year that have been bestsellers. So it says during last month or during last summer's Black Lives Matter protests, books written by people of color climbed the bestseller list. You see a lot of Michelle Obama, the Vanishing Half, um, Stamped. So then we keep going. Then it says, was last summer a vision of equality to come for the publishing industry or a flash in the pan? Now watch this. Look at this. Look at this comparison of bestsellers by white authors this year compared to the ones by black and POC authors. And look where the surge is. So George Floyd was murdered in June, I believe. And, you know, more protests and worldwide protests erupted late June, July. So look at the surge, July, August, September, and then down and then we have a little bit of November. The article starts by talking about an author, Nana Kwame Adeji Brenya, I believe. Um, had turned just turned 26 when he got the call that Mariner Books wanted to publish his short story collection, Friday Black. So he suspected the contract that he signed, which was a $10,000 advance and $40,000 for an unfinished second book, wasn't ideal, but his father had cancer and money provided a modicum of security. So just look at those numbers already. I already know that's not enough, but he was in, you know, a predicament and needed to take the money. So I don't know if you were paying attention on Twitter earlier this year during the summer where LL McKinney, who is a black YA author, started the hashtag publishing paid me to get um, white authors and black and POC authors to share if they, you know, wanted to what publishing paid them for their books. And what was shown was a staggering discrepancy in payment like this first tweet that's shared in the article is mandy lynn cotron i don't know she said i a totally unknown white woman with one viral article 
got an advance that was more than double what Roxane Gay got for her highest advance. Publishing paid me $400,000 for How to Fall in Love with Anyone. I've written an essay about this forthcoming, but I want to say more here. $400,000. I don't know what, I've never heard of it. Um, and it was quote tweeted, Roxanne Gay tweeted, it's pretty well known, but $12,500 for an untamed state, $15,000 for bad feminist, $100K for hunger, $150,000 for a year I learned everything, and a significant jump for my next two nonfiction non -fiction books. So that's for Roxanne Gay. After she had already published books that are very popular, especially bad feminist, she only got $150,000 for one, where this person who hadn't written anything but one viral article got $400,000. Publishing paid me, more people came out and tweeted. I think there was one where some white dude wrote some random book. I think he got like $800,000 advance for it and then everyone on booktube went and read it and did like a review and it was terrible and I'm like, you just gave him more whatever. But that's when all of that was happening and so this of course is all around the time the the protests are taking place and business everybody is posting their black square and their statement to do better including publishing so they have some from publishers we got Ping penguin random house saying we stand against racism and violence toward the black community and we commit to listening to our readers to our authors and to our teams as we work towards becoming part of the change Harper Collins also said, we stand with all of our colleagues, authors, readers, and partners who experience racism and oppression. Black stories matter, black lives matter. And this is Hachette. We had Hachette Books and Hachette Go Stand Against Racism and Police Violence. We continue to support black writers, readers, and people of color by sharing their stories and experiences in many of the books we publish. Black voices matter and we will continue to work together to share and elevate those voices. So the article says, but measuring pro progress isn't easy and requires a baseline to compare against. So they went and did research. Um, this is books that are in English language that are fiction. And they were published between 1950 and two, 2018. And they did ones that were widely read and they had to be held at at least 10 libraries. So it can say that they were read, you know, by more than just a few people. They also did it at the most pro prolific publishing houses during their time of analysis, which is Simon & Schuster, Penguin Random House, Doubleday, which was a major publisher before it merged with Random House in 1998, HarperCollins, and Macmillan. So after that, they had 8,004 books written by 4,010 authors. And so they also, to identify authors' races and ethnicities, they work with three research assistants, reading through biographies, interviews, and social media posts. They interviewed each author, um, until they could come to an agreement about the author's race. If they didn't, they didn't include it. So they had already guessed that the majority of authors would be white, but they were shocked after they finished of 7,124 books for which we identify the author's race. Now this is fiction. 95% were written by white people. Um, the, let's see. Author diversity at major publishing houses has increased in recent years, but white writers still dominate. Non-Hispanic white people account for 60% of the U.S. population. In 2018, they wrote 89% of the books in our sample. So that was 2018, but they're saying of their whole collection um, that they sampled, 95% were written by white people. So of course that starts at the top because the heads of the big five, soon to become the big four, are white. 85% um, of the people who work at the public in industries are white, the ones who acquire and edit books, agents. Um, so there's a correlation between the number of people of color who work in publishing and the number of books that are published by authors of color. And so they use an example. So T Toni Morrison, rest in peace, she was an editor at Random House from 1967 to 1983. She was the Random House's first black female editor. So during her tenure, 3.3% of the 806 books published by Random House were written by black authors. But that number dropped sharply at Random House as soon as she left. Out of the 512 books published by Random House between 1984 and 1990, just two were written by black authors, one by Miss Morrison, Beloved, and Sarah Phillips by Andrea Lee. Um, they also talk about Marie Dutton Brown, who started as an intern at Doubleday in 1967 and she had worked her way up to a senior editor. Um, she said she attributed the fluctuation in publisher support for black writers to the news cycle, which periodically directs the nation's attention to acts of brutality against black people. 
Publishers' interest in amplifying black voices wanes as media coverage peters out because many white editors are not exposed to black life beyond the headlines. And that is so true, especially this year. That's exactly what she said, that publishers' interest in black stories mirror the media. So they're like, oh my gosh, everyone's talking about Black Lives Matter and all of these things. We need to pay attention. We need to get some more black stories. We need to amplify their voices. And then that happened for a couple months and then it drops down. So um, they also talked about some things that may make it look like there's more published black authors or authors of color than there really are. Um, so they're saying like it's obscured by a number of high profile nonfiction books written by athletes, celebrities and politicians of color. So it'll make it looks like there are a lot of black bu books published because I'm sure if you talk to somebody like look at Michelle Obama, look at Barack, like of course those are going to be big deals. They're going to get paid millions of dollars and they're going to be on every bookshelf. But that is definitely not the majority. But if you look at the New York Times bestseller list for fiction, it's a different picture. Only 22 of the 220 books on the list this year were written by people of color. And um, so LL McKinney said, I've heard things like we already have our black girl book for the year. She also remembers comments suggesting books wouldn't sell if they had a black person on the cover. So LL McKinney also said, it's amusing to me when publishers say they don't follow the market. They're doing it because of tradition and the tradition is racism which is uh, facts. Then they bring in Angie Thomas and the Hate You Give. That was another um, thing that people are gonna reach to if you talk about there's not a lot of books published by black or POC authors. You're gonna be like, well, look at the Hate You Give. And it's like, yes, yeah, sir. Angie Thomas got lucky though. And I don't wanna discredit anything. I love the Hate You Give. I'm really excited about her next book, but she got lucky. In the publishing paid me hashtag, she didn't share. And she said she didn't wanna share because then people would be like, oh, see, you do get paid because she got paid a lot of money. She got a six, at least a six figure deal. And then she immediately got a movie deal. So she's definitely one of the minority of black authors who got a, what their book was worth, not a good deal, what their book was worth. And so Michael Struther, a former editor at Simon and Schuster, he says he remembers meeting with colleagues in 2016 um, when they were trying to pitch The Hate You Give and saying that it was a, a obviously a young adult novel about the fallout from a police shooting. And obviously he was saying it's not only a good book, but it's very marketable. It's an important book. It should have been an easy yes, um, but it said a lot of them were hesitant. Here's a great quote. One asked, do we need Angie Thomas if we have Jason Reynolds, who is another black author of young adult novels? So they're like, oh, we already got one. Do we need any more? And I guess that Simon & Schuster did make a six figure bid for her book, but it went to another publisher. So they made a six figure bid and it went to another publisher. So you know it was higher than that. So she got paid and she got paid well for her book. Um, but that is not the case for most authors. And then of course there have been like, what did I talk about in a couple weeks ago? Simon & Schuster now has a, under Simon & Schuster was it Avon Books? And then under them is Black Privilege, which is a, like a subsidiary of Simon & Schuster that's gonna be led by Charlemagne, um, focusing on black books, which I'm very excited about. I'm not excited about the person who's heading it, but obviously some publishers are doing that. Hachette announced in October the creation of Legacy Lit, um, one of several imprints starting this year that are devoted to publishing books by writers of color, and it's led by Krishan Trotman. Um, she said she's seen waves of support for black authors come and go, but Legacy Lit represents a real commitment to diversity by Hachette. So hopefully having um, imprints like this focused on black books led by a black person, she said that's why we need these imprints. They'll be here even after all the hoopla dies down. So, I mean, there is hope. Um, in 1967, when Miss Brown started at Double Day, she was only she was the only black intern but in 2019 almost half of publishing interns are people of color so those things are important um, but we also need black editors people in acquisitions they need to be on all all rungs of the ladder within publishing so that we can increase the amount of black and poc authors that are being included and not just published but on the working side too because even if you are acquiring these books you need um, maybe you need a black editor because a person who's white reading the story may try to tell you to change all these things because it's not correct or not proper because they can't relate to the language or a uh, theme in the story so i don't that shouldn't be surprising but it it still was upsetting and of course 
there were a lot of tweets um, just going into detail about how, how shady that is. A great tweet by Leah Johnson was publishing praise on the desperation of marginalized writers. When your choice is between not paying your rent or paying your rent slash not eating or eating, you do what it takes to survive. And for so many of us, art is the only way we've been able to imagine a path out. I think about also in writing, and this is obviously not everyone, but in general, um, there are more black people and people of color in poverty or you know struggling day to day living paycheck to paycheck and there are plenty of them who I'm sure have amazing stories in their mind or maybe are even working on them but haven't had time to finish them because taking time to write is time consuming it's a privilege there's you know people who had parents who could help them and so maybe they took time off after college and they could just focus on writing or you were able to live with your parents and they didn't ask you to pay rent so maybe you only had to work part-time and could focus on writing these are also things that go into people's ability to be published not to say that you can't do it i'm sure there are people out there who have worked two jobs and taken care of children and written a book but it's not to say that hasn't been a barrier to some like there's just so many levels and it's not just money like time and and resources and support if you don't have anyone supporting you that can be really hard to take time out of your day to sit down and write a story when you know that maybe you should get be getting a second job so you can keep your light on so you could feed your kids so oh it just gets me so um it gets me riled up there was a great um, thread that Okay, cone dog. Okay. Please leave be. Okay. I'm sorry, this is so awkward. <laughs> okay, hold on. All right. Cone baby has joined me. So we're going to try to make this work without dropping my laptop on the floor. Please ignore if there's any snoring that starts because he's getting really cozy. So this thread said, this just solidifies my opinion that our current deals need reworking and restructuring to account for publishing's rampant systemic racism. Even after publishing paid me, the Black Lives Matter statement, the Black Squares, were still being offered substantially less than white people. And only white people are shocked at this data. Herson's 1950 essay reads contemporary. An immensely gifted writer and anthropologist, Herson toiled in obscurity, died penniless, her grave unmarked until Alice Walker honored her. That's what I can look forward to? Nah, son. <laughs> the gift here says run me my money. They said, agents, editors, etc. If you're repping and acquiring the work of marginalized people, you've got to be prepared to shake the table and get us what we deserve and then some. We fight as hard as possible, but there's only so much we can do and should do. We can't fix a mess we didn't make. We rebuke that Highlander. There can only be one bullshit in regards to us when we see the 11 billion incarnation of white girls saving the world, winning multi-house bidding wars and making white writers millionaires over and over. Rebuke it saying that he suspected that the contract he signed a ten thousand dollar advance for friday black and forty thousand for an unfinished second book wasn't ideal but his father had cancer and the money provided a modicum of security imagine seeing the jig but des desperation wins out these jim crow deals keep us locked into a systemic cycle of poverty and abuse exacerbated by publishing's lackluster marketing of our work which decimates sales and provides a convenient scapegoat for abandoning our work altogether. It's beyond insidious. Most of us can't even get on the door. And if we do, this is what awaits us. It's a sin and a shame. But go ahead and think all that's required is opening your DM for a few weeks to us or sporadic awards or buying our books that you didn't even bother to pick up. Racism is solved. I really want to go back to that, that part right there. Um, these Jim Crow deals keep us locked into a systemic cycle of poverty and abuse exacerbated by publishing's lackluster marketing of our work, which decimates sales and provides a convenient scapegoat for abandoning our work altogether. They put so much in to promoting books by white authors, same similar stories. The promotion is outrageous with they, all of the additions and, and all of these things. And it's like, you could make one less edition of this new Holly Black book and maybe put that into another author and promote the shit out of that book so it can get hype and then sell well. Because when you don't take the time to market a book correctly, um, hype it up, get the you know promotion out there and then it doesn't do well, is it really the book's fault or is it your fault? I don't work in publishing, but that was, that was upsetting 
again not entirely surprising and then a tangent on that when we already have this bullshit going on and i spoke about this a few weeks ago with was it simon and schuster that they are acquiring fox news books or they have a new imprint called fox news books which we don't need we do not need i saw that kellyanne conway who was, uh, what was she, the advisor to freaking Orange shit stain, has got a multi-million dollar advance for a Trump tell-all book. We don't want this. Nobody needs this. Unless you're telling all about something so they can send that motherfucker in that whole cabinet, including your ass to jail, we don't need this bullshit. And it says that it's supposed to be, um, of all the White House insiders, Kellyanne is gonna write the most unvarnished, eye-popping account of her time working for the president. She's got some of us quaking in our boots. Yeah, right. Um, the source also said she could score even more money from movie rights. I, I couldn't find what publisher is paying. Um, it mentioned someone else's deal that was like $2 million that hers is gonna go right over that. And it's ridiculous. And this just plays right into publishing. What the fuck? do you need to waste millions of dollars for on her bullshit ass book it's not gonna be no it's not gonna be an eye-popping account of her time working for the president she kisses that man's ass so i doubt it's gonna be anything scandalous or scalding like it doesn't matter if she wants to tell that write a fucking blog or something like kiss my ass kellyanne nobody needs this book i want to know what fucking publishing house is writing this book if it's fucking simon and schuster who published her past book in the past. I'm losing my mind. You're all over here committing to all this stuff. A part also of committing to diversity and uplifting um, and amplifying black voices is to not put money into books like this. Use that money to promote and uplift black voices instead of wasting it on this dusty ass mess. I, I'm so pissed. So there is a large bookstore that has a few locations in Denver and it's called the tattered cover and so i guess it is colorado's largest and most prominent bookstore chain and it has been sold to a local investment group after its rockiest year in memory and the investment group is led by a black man so this is obviously editing jessica so i obviously cut this piece because while editing i was sent a message by someone that changes everything so I was talking about the Tattered Cover, which is the largest um, independent bookstore in Denver or in Colorado. And it was recently bought out by an investment group that is led by a black man, Kwame, um, Kwame Spearman. So it's like a 13 person investment group. And Kwame and his friend David, who were high school rivals, have gone into this together. So Kwame Alexander worked at one of their locations when he was 15, like as a cashier and now he's into venture capitalism david back is white kwame is black and then the majority of people on the board are white so the people include um colorado rockies owner dick monfort davida ceo kent theory and wife denise o'leary philanthropist margie gart boulder based foundry group investor brad field and illegal pete's burrito chain founder pete turner there's also john Sargent, who was a former ceo of mcmillan and ex-american booksellers association leader oren j teicher so it is a very white and prominent wealthy venture capitalist group that is coming in to buy this and so when i first read the article i was like i was like okay but it's still exciting it's going to be black owned because the article is framing it as the sale makes the tattered cover the us's largest black owned bookstore it sounded really exciting and i remember scrolling down to the bottom of the article and there was a comment like oh it was sold sold to an investment group so it's just going to become like a barnes and noble and this store currently has four locations i think and they're opening another one and so i was like this is really exciting um it's still locally owned but then i saw this other article that was just sent to me that says black booksellers denounce tattered cover announcement so the announcement made earlier this week has a um, black booksellers across this country upset so this article says from washington dc to la black bookstores have been at the forefront of a resurgence of independent bookselling in america over the last decade but the framing of the announcement about the purchase of denver's tattered cover bookstore was met with withering criticism from black booksellers 
Specifically, black booksellers are offended and angered by the decision of the new owners to call the tattered cover the country's largest black owned bookstore, which they say appears to be little more than a branding opportunity. So this is saying the majority of the ownership's group members are white and many, including Spearman and Bat, come from the overwhelmingly white world of venture capital. No one really has book selling experience except Kwame's experience of being a cashier when he was a teenager. Add this to earlier in the year, the tattered cover got flack for a neutrality statement in the response of George Floyd's killing. Um, you know, like saying they were gonna be neutral about it, not saying anything. So they got a lot of backlash, people saying they weren't gonna shop there anymore. And um, the article says, this news caps a year in which black booksellers in historically black owned businesses have worked tirelessly to provide anti-racist titles to new white audiences at the expense of being forced to suppress personal trauma that stems in part from working in an industry that has left unaddressed problems with systemic racism. How fitting, this just goes into everything I was just talking about with the publishing article. Um, so Danielle Mullen, who is the owner of Semicolon Bookstore in Chicago, said, I'm extremely offended. It's a slap in the face to the work black booksellers have been doing all this time when we couldn't get capital from banks to buy out existing businesses. Um, it's hurtful to black booksellers who have been doing the hard work and then they take the same credit without real black representation. It's disappointing and almost unbelievable. Um, it's like if Jeff Bezos partnered with a black person and then said Amazon is the biggest black business, black owned business in the world. So I totally understand that. Like reading this just makes it make more sense why they would be upset. Um, another bookstore owner, Hannah Oliver Depp, she owns Loyalty Bookstore in Washington, D.C. in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, and she noticed a lack of or the absence of commitment to real change in their statement. She said, if this is going to be a genuinely black owned bookstore, meaning a stem to stern, top to bottom adjustment of core values and business practices to not just be black friendly, but infused with black culture, our ethics, morals, I would be jazzed out of my mind. But I don't see that from these press releases. I see branding. I see zero discussion of the horrific statements that came out of tattered cover over the past year. I don't see, I don't want to be the voice I don't want that to be the voice of Denver. So I, as a black man, stood up and found some investors and we did this together. Uh, Uncle Bobby's Coffee and Books in Philadelphia, Justin Moore said, being a black owned bookstore is more than just whose name is on the ownership papers. Just a simple transfer of ownership doesn't automatically qualify you to be a black owned bookstore in the same way that almost every black owned bookstore in the country operates. Um, and then this pairs in well with what I talked about in my last video. Um, they are, let's see, Noel Santos, who owns the Lit Bar in the Bronx, said that um, it makes her nervous that industry veterans like Teicher and former McMillan CEO John Sargent, both are, who are white and part owners of the group, um, concerned that this purchase is one of the many worrisome signs that the publishing industry is looking for easy ways to signal a commitment to anti-racism while actually continue to put white people first. As another example of such performative allyship, Santos pointed to Penguin Random House's rollout of a new edition of Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, which has been republished in an edition with a stamp showing it with a book was a book club hit by Jenner Hager Bush, daughter of former President George W. Bush. It was done without regard for the symbolism of stamping the book. So it's definitely another thing like, hey, we put her book in the book club. We're listening. We're learning. And uh, the impact of those kinds of decisions is greater than publishers are willing to recognize, Santos added. Spearman did reach out to publishers uh, weekly and said the framing of the sale was not meant to be disrespectful to black booksellers. In fact, just the opposite. Their successes led to this opportunity and I give them credit for their successes. Um, he said we were being literal as I am the largest shareholder in the store. Tattered Cover now being the largest black owned bookstore in the US is a factual representation. It was not intended to dismiss the incredible accomplishments of black booksellers. We intend to move forward with a mindset fueled by Black Lives Matter. And Spearman said that he tends to reach out to black booksellers as soon as possible and to work with them on matters of common concern, adding as a black male, my experiences, my experiences entwined with the black experience. So I totally understand both sides. He's being literal. And then they're saying you really need to earn that title and be an embodiment of a black bookstore. And so I hope that what he said at the end wasn't just to um, like make them feel better or, you know, ease their concerns. I hope he really is committed to doing that, to connecting and working with other black booksellers so he can learn about what they've done to be successful. 
because that would be incredible for that actually to be a super large black owned bookstore that is um truly has a lot of black culture infused into how they run the stores and how it uh, participates or meshes with the community i thank you so much for watching this video if i missed anything left anything out misinterpreted anything whatever you want to add leave it in the comments nigel and i also want to remind you to please check out our description um i have links to articles and um ways to donate for all the things that are going on in the world the people in the philippines still need help from the typhoons um information and ways to help about ending sars in nigeria there um is new things that I found out a few days ago about farmers in India. So I just have a lot of links down there so you can make yourself aware of what's going on so you can share those links. And if you have anything to donate, you can donate to help out other communities in need. But I appreciate you so much for watching this video. Please give it a thumbs up and subscribe, share if you'd like, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye!